Um, uh, thank you for coming. Those few of you who uh, I noticed there, you're all sitting next to the, you know, so that you can get out the doorway quick. Um, the uh, um, uh, just a reminder that there's a there's a sample midterm out on the web. Um, Sebastian is going to be holding um, the discussion this week to go over the exam um, a little bit uh, to, or to go over the material for the exam. Uh, he and I are meeting this afternoon, of which my my uh, one statement usually to him is that you can't answer the question that is, how should I answer question number four on the exam? Right, you can't answer that question. You can answer any, he can answer other questions about it, right? But you can't answer that specific question. So you can't ask that one, or you could try if you want. But uh, so he will be here on on that. We'll have an exam on Monday, and uh, um, and we'll get going. And then tomorrow, which is Thursday, there'll be a new assignment out there for you. Okay, that that'll be a little bit more. Let you do what you want to do this time. Ken won't tell you what to do. You'll, you'll tell Ken what you want to do. Type of a type of a problem, and I'll give you some hints. Um, so that's what we have going. Um, the exam. Uh, you need nothing but paper. No, you need nothing but pencil, or something to write with. I will give you paper. All right. And if you don't get enough paper on the, if you don't get enough on the front sides of my exams, you may use the back sides. Right, if you write more than the front side and the back side, you're probably not going to get it done in one hour. And uh, so, you know, and you're probably writing way too much. So uh, all, you need is a, all you need is a pencil uh, as you go along. So um, one of the neat things in graphics, there's a fellow at, uh, I, I scare faculty with this all the time, it's a fellow at the University of North Carolina named Henry Fuchs. And he's kind of the, one of the hardware guys uh, in the graphics world. He's done a lot of graphics hardware work and everything else. And he has a set of virtual reality goggles, um, which look very much like a set of glasses that you have. And it has a second set of lenses on the outside uh, out here. And it has, so it's like my set of glasses, second set of lenses on the outside. There's two small cameras. Um, basically, they're reflecting things, but they're two small projectors on each side that project images onto these second set of lenses. Okay, now there's a little uh, receiver up here so that you can tell exactly where your lenses are and how they're positioned. Now there's a little microphone that comes down in front of your mouth, a battery pack you actually, actually have to wear, which is by far the heaviest part. Um, and you can walk around with these virtual reality goggles and you can, and information can come on the goggles themselves. It should be great for taking exams. Okay, because you could get web pages up there, everything else. I scare the faculty about when I when I talk about these things. Um, they actually do exist. They actually, I've actually had them on. They're really good uh, for augmented reality. For augmented reality, um, labor negotiators are looking at them because they would like to have the data streaming across their goggles or people saying things while they're actually in negotiations. Um, they're actually uh, pretty cool. But you, if you think about it for a while, if you know where the goggles are, you can have Effectively, windows or des your desktop is all around you, right? Because you can look over here and there can be something. You can look over here and there can be something. You can look up here and there can be something. You can move things around. They're trying to figure out how to get a mouse for all this stuff. It's, it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting project. Um, but anyway, OK, today I'm going to do shadows. And there's three ways to do shadows that people typically do. One is ground plane shadows. Number two is uh, um, shadow volumes. Number three is depth buffer shadows. And um, these things are actually just wave your hand. Let me wave my hands at these three things first. Uh, ground plane shadows are kind of what it sounds like. You have a plane, which is the ground, okay? And you have somebody walking on this plane or some, a box on this plane or a table on this plane or something. We can actually generate a shadow on the ground plane fairly, fairly easily, okay? This is the easiest method. It's the most frequent one that's most frequently used. Um, 
It's uh, the, in, in some sense the simplest uh, to implement, um, et cetera, and uh, most people use it. In games, you see it all over the place, okay? Um, shadow volumes is the one that everybody wants to use, but nobody can figure out how to use in some sense. Um, it's effectively the case that if you look at um, if you look at something from the light source and there's something in the way, right? Effectively, there's a volume that this projects out, of which the things inside that volume were in shadow, right? And what we do, what we want to do is when we view these things, we want to look at them, right? in the context of are they inside one of these volumes or not inside one of these volumes, okay? The problem with this is it takes a huge amount of extra storage to do, okay? Um, the last one is depth buffer shadows, and it's, it's actually got, there is buried deep inside OpenGL a function that will actually do this for you. Um, the problem is not, it's not well um, documented and all is that it's a hard, it's very hard to use, and I'll show you. And it's basically the fact that if you think about it for a second, that shadows are the same as figuring out what's visible from the light source. It's a similar problem, okay? That those things that are visible from the light source, um, that if you, ooh, sorry, visible from the uh, viewpoint, if you look at those things that are visible from the viewpoint, if you look at the light source over here, those things that are visible from the light source are the things that are not in shadow. Okay, those things that are invisible from the light source are in shadow. And so it's saying, okay, if, if this whole thing is a uh, problem of calculating what's in front, well, I can use depth buffers to calculate what's in front, right? But then I have a depth buffer coming from the light source and I have a depth buffer coming from the eye point. How do I reconcile these two depth buffers and get this information out? And the answer is you can actually do it um, and make it work. You can reconcile these two depth buffers. So I'll show you that. I can probably only do these two today. I'll do this one next time, okay, um, as we go through. But the ideas here are all pretty simple, okay, all pretty straightforward. And uh, most people, every, this keeps coming back up over and over again. It was first proposed in 1976. And it keeps coming up over and over and over again. And people say, aha, I'm going to use sh you know, shadow volumes to do something. And then it just gets killed because it uses way too much. It generates way too much stuff. OK, so here's ground plane shadows. And this is really simple. We have a ground plane, OK, like this. And this could be the floor of this room. It could be just about anything. And what we want to do is we want to calculate a, uh, um, a shadow of something on this ground plane. And we have some kind of a light source over here, okay? And we have some object in the way, okay, between the light source that we want to calculate this shadow on. Here, I'll make this just a simple polygon here. And we want to calculate the shadow on this object. And what we do is I'm going to think of this object below as an infinite plane. And, and being a plane, it's defined with a point and a normal vector. There's some point and a normal vector defining this plane. And what we do is from this, uh, from this light source here, we track points. Uh, we project this um, object. Now I managed to get it exactly in line. Let me try it up here. <coughs> What we do is we project this object down into the ground plane. Like this. Does that picture kind of make sense? Okay, we project this down into the ground plane. And basically what, what we want to do is we want to calculate each one of these points, right? And then we define a polygon in the ground plane that happens to be black, okay? Or happens to be <coughs> dark gray, or happens to be the color of the ground plane, but in ambient, it has ambient only, no diffuse, no specular, something like that, okay? But we define a separate polygon down here, which is the shadow, and we draw the shadow. The trick is you draw it slightly up from the plane, 
Right? You draw these points slightly up from the plane because if things are all in the plane in the same plane, OpenGL will have trouble sometimes rendering them, right? It, getting them correct. So you, you kind of stack them up a little tiny bit. But I'll show you. But these but it's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, Zach, go ahead. You can only have one ground plane. Yes. Yes, one ground plane. Okay. Uh, now you can since what we're going to do is generate new polygons, okay? If you had something like this with a ground plane up here and a ground plane down there, right? Maybe separated by a foot, you could take this ground plane and you could take these polygons that we do and clip it off, right? Clip them off on one ground plane, right? And then project them on another ground plane and do them there. So you could use this kind of a clipping operation if you like. See, so anything you can do with polygons, you can do with these shadow polygons that you generate. Okay, and, and if you look at this, if this light source is up here at, say, L, right, at some point L, and <coughs> what we can do is we can take one of these points here and calculate a vector, okay, V along here, and then this calculation looks like that um, this point down here is something like L plus T times V, right? Uh, you take, you start at L and you go T along the vector V, where T is some distance along the vector V. And uh, you can uh, um, calculate this point down here because you know that this point and this point here, if I take a vector between those two, that these, vector, these two vectors have to be perpendicular, right? Because a normal vector has to be perpendicular to the plane. And so typically what you do then is you look at this, this vector, L plus T times V minus P. That's that vector uh, dotted with N, I think. There's that vector. has to be 0. Okay. And uh, you get, uh, uh, I'll write it a little bit differently, uh, T V dotted with N uh, plus L minus P dotted with n is 0. Did I just do that right? I think so. OK. And, and if you get here, you can see solve for t. You can see that t is equal to a minus, uh, um, um, minus L minus p dotted with n all over v dotted with n. OK. I think so, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, if you want to put the minus in here, it'll be p minus l. Yeah. Okay. So you can so you can calculate t real easy. It's just the ratio of two dot products. Okay. And uh, you know, got to be a little careful. You don't want this one on the bottom to be zero. But if v dotted with n is zero, that means that the vector v here <coughs> up here is actually perpendicular to n, right? And if V is perpendicular to N, it's pretty easy to see that this line is never going to intersect the plane. It's parallel to the plane, right? So um, it actually makes some sense. So the, the idea here is that you can calculate this point, this point, this point, and this point actually fairly easily, okay? Because you just do t, calculate the T four times. You get a new polygon out, which actually then you can color yourself, color black, color whatever you want. Okay, and it, be, and it can become a shadow. Now, um, the, uh, usually what we do is that we take this point and we lift it up. We know what n is perpendicular to this. And so we lift it up just a slight bit along this vector n. So it's a little bit higher than the ground plane. Okay, and in that way OpenGL will, will fix it up in depth wise and all because it'll be a little higher. And it's typically what we do. So you can see here that if you have um, a fairly complex figure out here, okay, um, like a uh, um, the stairway going up, you know, the circular stairway going up, or something like this, which has maybe hundreds of, maybe thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of polygons in them, right? You can do this with all your polygons. It's actually pretty easy to do. The, the point is, the trouble is, you're going to get 100,000 polygons on the floor representing the shadow. Okay? 
And the difficulty with this with this whole thing is that um, we uh, um, our shadows end up being, you know, they can be really complex and and can you can add a lot of extra stuff to your scene, but it works in general. It works very nicely. Um, the other thing we try to do is that if you have point light shorts, well, you get this very quickly. If you have point light sources, you tend to get um, sharp edge shadows. And most people don't like sharp edge shadows. Okay, if you look at your feet right now, the shadow, if you can even see anything under your feet, is not sharp. Okay. And um, it's, um, so what do you do? Well, um, I'll do a little bit while I do shadow volumes here in a second. <coughs> but you uh, you can see that uh, on this ground plane, you know, th there's nothing. Oh, let's see. What do you do? You texture it. Okay? You texture it so the boundary's fuzzy. Okay? That's what most people do here, is they create a texture of which the boundary is fuzzy. Okay? And uh, um, it's actually fairly s straightforward to do. And then you end up with a fuzzy shadow underneath. Okay? If your object's too complex up here, what many people do, and you'll see many games do this, is they take this huge complex thing that you have, define maybe many hundreds of polygons, and you put a, an ellipse around it. You kind of fit an ellipse around it. Okay? And then you project the ellipse down onto the floor, which actually is a, it's a little harder calculation, but not so bad. You project the ellipse down on the floor, and you make the ellipse the shadow. Okay? And if you see, uh, um, I remember the first time I saw Tiger Woods golf, right, when Tiger walked up to the tee, underneath his, there was basically a, an elliptical shadow for his foot, right, for his shoe under each one of his feet. Okay? That they had basically just taken an elliptical map of the shoe, right, and use that for the shadow. Um, but this is ground plane shadows. Everybody uses it. It's actually pretty easy to do. It only works if you've got a ground plane, okay? Um, if you want to, um, if you want to take somebody's arm and project the shadow onto the rest of the body, uh-uh, okay? If this, if this thing is curved, over here you're dead with this thing because you need this planar equation to be able to solve, okay? It's effectively trying to calculate for each one of these points a ray coming in and also if this is curved here, the shadow's curved and, and you're sunk, okay? So this is ground plane shadows. It's actually pretty easy to do and you could probably write this up in a very short amount of time to take a light source, project the things onto a plane and make it go, okay? Probably could be written up a very short amount of time. Worst calculation you have to do here, ratio of dot products. So, okay, what about the next one? The next one is, um, let me, I'll move into here. The next one is shadow volumes. Okay. And shadow volumes have the same type of a thing. What a shadow volume does is if you have this, this, this object here and a light source up here, I'll say. What a shadow volume does is a similar thing. Except what it does is it adds a volume, makes a volume out of the shadow projected by this object. Okay, so what it does here is it takes this thing, which is this original polygon, and it creates another polygon, four more polygons coming out of here, <coughs> which are very, very huge and long polygons. Okay, so you have now, you end up with five polygons in here. Can everybody see my shadow volume is five polygons big now? You take this object, and actually, it's like I can do it with four, but, uh, and you create this polygon here. Here, right? This polygon over here, this polygon over here, etc. Okay, you get these big, huge polygons running around. 
And then if you have another object back here and you want to know that this object, if this object is in shadow, what you do is you modify the rendering algorithm that actually looks at these things, okay? And it looks this way. It goes this way. Suppose with my eye point I'm looking into this object here, okay? Suppose with my eye point I'm looking into this object and I'm going to try to draw, figure out if that point's in shadow or not. What I do is I take my ray, like this, going in, and I say, does this ray hit this shadow volume? And does it not hit this shadow volume? Okay? So I figure out where this ray it exits and intersects the shadow volume. Every time it enters a shadow volume, I, I, up my, I up a counter by one. Every time it exits a shadow volume, I, up my, I decrease my counter by one. Okay? If when I actually hit this object, my counter is zero, then it's not in shadow. Okay? If my counter is greater than zero, it's going to be in shadow. Everybody see it? And perhaps the 2D picture is even better, right? So here's a light source. Here's my object here. Here's a, my shadow volume. Okay, my shadow volume now includes these lines here. Okay, if I have this object right here, 2D object, and I have an eye point down here that I'm looking at, what I do is I sync for every point of this object I want to do, and if you remember the process called scan conversion where I detail all the points on my polygons, for each one of these things here, that I want to do, I add one for each time I enter a shadow volume, and I exit, subtract one every time I leave a shadow volume. Okay? Now these shadow volumes usually entering and exiting, I usually put the normal vectors to these, ve to these things pointing into the volume, so that I can figure out how, you know, where, whether I'm going inside or out, because if I take a vector along the direction here, if I'm going into a shadow volume, the two vectors, if I take their dot product, it's going to be positive. If I, going outside of, and I take the two vectors and I take their dot product, it's going to be negative. So I can tell if I go inside or outside these shadow volumes. <clears throat> and this counting process is not too hard to implement into the ray tracing part of the algorithm. And then it doesn't matter if I have a whole bunch of things here, not a ground plane, but if I have a whole bunch of things. All I have to do is keep this count going, okay? All I have to do is count how many times I cross these, these shadow volumes. Now, that's all, that's all good. It's not too hard to implement. Unfortunately, um, what matters, what, what the problem is, is that um, if you've noticed, for each one of these, these polygons here, if my polygon has n sides to it, Okay, I'm going to gen generate n new polygons, right? And I'm going to put them into my scene that I'm going to have to look at. So if I have, all right, a million triangles in my scene and I want to generate fresh shadows off them, I'm going to get three million shadow volumes. And <coughs> one of the problems is that three, these three million shadow volumes, if you look, here's, here's one thing, here's another thing, here's another thing, right, that each one of these things would get shadow volumes, and a lot of these shadow volumes are going to be coincident. So I'm going to go outside one, I'm going to go immediately inside another, and it's going to cost me a lot of time to do this. Um, it's actually pretty easy to do. You could actually take a light source, right, and a polygon, and probably generate all these shadow polygons yourself, right? The problem is, is that it, it is a huge increase in storage that you have to do, and none of those shadow polygons are visible, ever. Okay, none of them are ever visible. And so you, you've loaded up your system with a ton of extra polygons, right, maybe a hundred times as much as what you actually have originally, and none of them are actually visible. Okay, and, but you can replace this counting process, it's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, this counting process in order to uh, uh, to make it work. 
Now, uh, again, this one is done, and what stops it over and over again is the fact that you just have to generate all the shadow polygons, no matter what. Okay? And there have been ways to try to reduce the number of shadow polygons by, you know, uh, trying to figure out uh, if they're coincidental and things like this, and it still generates things and generates them up too much. Well, there was. This, this thing keeps, shadow polygons keep dying. Uh, you know, the people stop thinking about them and then they spring back up because they can solve a couple extra problems or something. What happens if the polygon is a circle or a sphere? Um, that's not a polygon. That, but yeah. You have infinite. If you have a, a huge, uh, well, you don't, you don't do a circle or sphere. What you do is you approximate it by triangles or something, and then you do all the triangles. Basically, you have to determine which edge is the outside part and which is going into the center. Yeah, every, you every triangle will have two edges, which is inside and one, and one edge is outside. So you have to determine the outside edges. You would have to somehow determine the outside edges. Yep. Okay. But the other thing is that um, that this comes close to solving is one that looks like this, and this is this is one that keeps popping up every now and then. Um, if I have, let me make my object a little smaller here. Um, uh, let's see. If I have a light source now that looks like a uh, looks like an area light source, it turns out that um, if you have something that looks like an area light source, right, you get um, something called. Um, you get a shadow that looks like there's an, it's got a fuzziness to it, okay? And there's an area inside called the umbra, which is the place, the part that's completely in shadow, right? And there's something outside called the penumbra, which is kind of drifting off between totally in shadow and partially seeing the light source. And you can kind of see that, that Perhaps a point out here could would see almost all of this light source, right? But a point inside here would see none of it, right? And a point close to here would see just a little tiny piece of the light source. And in these ways, uh, shadow volumes have been used because what people can do now this picture is going to get bad is they can <coughs> generate these shadow polygons. Like this, and another one from back here, like this. They can generate multiple shadow polygons, right? So that you can, as you trace a ray in, you can see, you can kind of uh, phase in your shadow until it's dark and phase it out as you go back. The trouble, the problem with this is that you get so many shadow polygons running around that you can't. You know, it just gets too hard to work with. And, uh, um, but it's, it keeps, people keep trying it, okay? People keep trying this. So shadow volumes, the difference between these two, a ground plane shadow is just, you take things and you just project them on the ground, and they just become new polygons in your scene, right? You color them dark and they're shadows, okay? And, and it's a reasonable thing to do um, for a lot of games and things like this. Uh, for uh, these shadows, for, for uh, um, shadow volumes, it's, they actually try to create a polygonal solid that is the volume itself of the shadow, right? And then try to modify the rendering algorithm a little bit to count how many times you go into one of these volumes and how many times you go, come out. And if you, if you count plus one for every time you go in, minus one for every time you go out, you have to realize many of these will overlap, okay? Plus one and minus one, the things that are actually in light are the ones that are zero. Go ahead. But don't you have to actually do a full ray trace for that point? No, you can actually play some other games to do less than that. Okay, you can actually play some other games. Um, so um, you know this is it, and actually, you know, I'm going to have to draw some some more interesting pictures. Uh, that's these two. The other one is depth buffer, and what we're going to do is we're going to 
do a depth buffer view from the eye point, right? And then we're going to do a depth buffer view from the camera point, and we're going to reconcile these two. And the way we can reconcile them is that we have a 4x4 four four matrix, which gets us down into image space from the eye point. We have a 4x4 four four matrix that gets us down into image space from the camera point. And if we can get a rotation matrix or something that gets one of our, gets the camera view into the other view, we can use the inverse matrices in one sense and the forward matrices in the other sense to get us from one image space to the other, back and forth, and do this comparison. So I'll show you that last, I'll sh show you that next time, and I'll leave you alone so you can go work on your problems for the rest of today.